So um, there's a lot of interesting projects going on um, in our um, subgroup, but today, because we're supposed to talk about one thing, and we're supposed to talk about stuff we haven't talked about so much before, also a little bit of uh, the spirit of this um, skiminar so far has been with uh, the presence of Learn, with uh, Corinne and uh, Tagami, even some of the discussions around Cellulo. Um, how can we take the stuff that we build in our lab and actually get it out into the world? Uh, so I thought that would be an interesting thing to, to think about. So um, we have this product, this tool um, called Frog with a beautiful graphic by Louis. And um, most of you, I think, are somewhat familiar. Uh, it's the idea that you have different activities uh, on different social planes that you can sequence and that there can be data flowing uh, that the teacher can actually orchestrate this in a classroom. And there's a lot of different kinds of research that we can do around this. So we can um, look at learning analytics, like uh, predicting progress or um, analyzing collaborative learning from um, collaborative writing behavior. There's stuff we do about um, collaborative learning scripts where we design a script and run it in a classroom and we analyze the data. We're also interested in how teachers orchestrate. So we film teachers at the University of Lausanne as they are orchestrating uh, 300 students to see which dashboards are useful, how much time they're looking at the screen or the students. So all of that's going on. But in the meantime, we realized that we've built up a technology that's starting to become quite interesting, um, but that sees almost no usage at the current pace. So it's true, there are some people who are or have been using Frog, right? CS211, CS411, these are uh, peers courses. One is a large lecture where we ran several um, scripts with hundreds of students. One is a master's course where we both run scripts with students but where students are also um, designing and running their own scripts as, way of, uh, as part of learning. Um, we have, uh, my friend in Norway has been running a, a number of, of different scripts with teacher candidates. Um, there's uh, an online master course in the uh, University of Minnesota that's been using Frog for every single class through the whole semester. And there's a middle school in Romanshorn in Switzerland, uh, which has been using it for language learning. So, Quite a, a broad uh, swath, and there's a few others that have used it once or twice. So, you know, quite a broad swath of, of usage and lots of interesting experiences for us. But still, this is not a lot of people. And most of these are very heavily supported by us. Um, so we want to continue doing all kinds of research around Frog, but uh, my question today is, are we at a stage where we can begin to think about making a subset of this functionality much more widely um, available? This could have two benefits. The first one could be that eventually we might want to think about a sustainability strategy for Frog, um, po possibly parallel to the research continuing, but having some kind of entity um, would be interesting. Um, the other thing is that certain kinds of research are only possible if we have a large amount of users. So we can design a complex graph writing XML by hand if we had to, and run it with uh, 10,000 people in the MOOC and we can get really good research. But if we want to look at teacher orchestration and we want 30 different teachers to do something in their classroom, we need something that is more widely used and is more usable. So what are the current barriers? Well, here's an example of a script that we ran in Pierre's class. Okay, we did a survey. We asked students what was difficult to learn. Um, we showed it on the, on the, on the projector. Pierre did some slides, we put them in groups, we had them find a solution to each learning challenge, and we did a debrief. So when I present it to you like this, it's not a super complicated thing. I think everyone can kind of understand what's going on. Um, the color coding here is um, another representation of social planes, right? Because we believe in multiple representations for learning. So here we have some individual activity, some whole class activity, some group activity. Now, if we put this on an orchestration graph, as they look in Frog currently, and we just put the activities, individual activity, whole class debrief, individual, group, again, it's not horribly complicated. I mean, it could be prettier and all that, but I think most people are able to follow along. The complication comes when we add the data flow, right? So, because what we're doing here is we're taking the data from this activity and sending it here. Here we're forming groups, and based on those groups, we're grouping the results 
of the students in each group, and we're sending it here. And this is both, it's complicated at a glance to see what's going on here. And it's also hard to know how to construct it. So which one should I put and what works with what? And I think this is currently the biggest barrier to having people actually use Frog as an authoring tool. This can get worse. This is an actual graph that was run in Norway with 60 students, which worked perfectly. They were very happy with it. Um, but I constructed it, <laughs> right? And I cannot... Uh, you can see that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm not uh, asking any teacher to learn how to do this, right? So what's going on here? All the product docs, so these guys are product operators. So it means they take data from one activity, like the thing you wrote, and it does something with it. It aggregates, disaggregates, translates to Spanish. But we can't tell, right? <laughs> because they all look the same. So that seems to be a simple thing to change. Like yeah. we can have icons for different. And I think here, my idea is not to have 30 different icons, but rather to say aggregate, disaggregate, uh, redistribute. That we, and there, if we can find someone who's, who's a little bit better at graphical thinking, I think coming up with some kind of nice symbols would make a lot of difference. Um, another thing, so basically the way we started with Frog is that we wanted something that was as flexible um, as possible. So we wanted a system that was really, you know, kind of a, a Lego where you can connect almost anything to anything else. So the way operators are implemented right now is that each operator says, I accept this kind of data, I produce this kind of data. But until runtime, I don't know what I'm going to get and what I'll I mean, obviously, what I'll produce depends on what I'm getting. Um, so that means that we have to often over-specify. For example, if you want to send data to groups, the operator also needs to know the groups. And we have to explicitly connect the social operator that creates the groups to the operator that sends data to the groups. Right? And this gives us a lot of flexibility. But basically what's happening is that the underlying you know, AST, if you want to call it like that, of the frog graph is fully exposed to the user. And I think here we can do a lot of simplification to um, especially make the common cases much simpler um, without, but while keeps, still keeping the, compl the possibility of having very strange setups if you want that. Um, so as I said, all data flows have to be declared explicitly, which is why here you actually just create a single group, right? You randomly group students in groups of four. But because all data flows have to be declared explicitly, we have 100 links going from the social operator to each individual activity. And in that case, even just making that cleaner would, would make this a lot nicer to look at. Another thing, this is um, a, a more of a, a design decision that we took early on that is made some things a lot simpler, but is holding us back a bit. Currently, all operators current, can fire only once. So an operator is basically just a function, data in, data out. And right now, it gets all of the data from the, all the students that finish the activities. It does whatever it needs to do, and it produces some output. And that is nice because it means for the person who writes the operator, they don't really have to worry about, you know, they can do clustering, they can do all kinds of things. But um, here we have a problem. Because what if this activity already gets started? So also, the uh, operators fire when they're needed. So it means when, it, when the teacher opens this activity, it will see, are there any incoming data? Yes, from this operator. OK, I need to make sure that operator has been fired. Now, what if you come late to class? Well, the operator's already run, so you can't join the group. So you cannot actually join the graph right now, which is um, a big, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> practical disadvantage, right? So something we need to fix. Um, another problem here is that, again, is this a valid graph? Is this going to crash? Are all these operators getting the data that they need? Now, we do have um, some type checking built in. So if you look at the top there, in this case, this is an invalid graph. It's giving me two error messages. It's saying, you put in an operator, but you didn't even tell me what kind of operator. So I don't know what to do about that. And you put in a group activity, but you didn't tell me which group. Right? So it does check some things. But the really important thing is that it does not check the validity of the data flow. Um, so if you take um, a quiz and you send all the data into a YouTube player, 
it's not going to know what to do about those data. And worst case, it might crash. Best case, it might just ignore it, right? Now, this is a non-trivial problem um, for, because it's not just two activities linked. It could be a whole range. But we have good ideas about how to solve this, and this is very important. So the goals are, on the one hand, it should be much easier to construct a valid graph, to discover what are the possibilities, how can I connect things. On the other hand, it should be impossible to, well, it should be possible to construct an invalid graph, but it should be impossible to run it, right? The, the pipe checker there, if it's read now, you won't be able to create a session. So, you know, you can design all you want, but if it's green, you should know that it will never crash in production, that all the data flows will be valid. So this is key if we're ever going to have other people use this system. Now, the introduction of learning items, which you've kind of heard about a little bit here and there, it's basically an abstraction of student content. That means that we can have the same kind of content in many different kinds of activities is actually a major improvement here because it means that many more activity types are compatible by default. Um, and it also means that we can redesign the operators um, in a more intelligent way. I'm not gonna go into the details, but that's, um, and also to have the operators be more flexible about when they're firing or firing multiple times. So um, I have some other ideas about redesigning the graphs here. I'm just in my beautiful design fashion showcasing a few ideas. So the first one is, um, what if we have a line uh, and we said this is pre-class. Any activity, any operator that you put here will fire immediately as you initialize the session. Okay? The advantage of that would be that if you have already a class list and you create groups, you can now click on this operator and you see the groups that have been generated and you might want to change them because you say, well, Peter doesn't like to work with Anne, so I'm going to uh, move them, right? Or we have some operators that get data from the internet. So this might be an operator that gets blog posts about Iraq because you want to discuss Iraq. And now, A, you want to make sure that it triggers because maybe it's using an API of a service that's down and that's really embarrassing if that happens during class. I mean, that's nothing, not something we can control. Secondly, you can click on that, you can see all the items and you might want to remove some of them because they're not appropriate, right? So I think this is one thing that could give the teachers a bit more uh, comfort with actually going into the class and knowing that the data is there, the students are in the right groups, it's all set up correctly. Another thing is, my, my, right now, we can link directly between two activities. It's actually not something we planned for, but because of the way we did the code, it just kind of works. But it doesn't work in a very intelligent fashion. Um, what I want to change it to is that if you link between two activities, it is a bit more intelligent. So for example, 99% of the case time, if you link from an individual to group activity, you want each group to get the products of its members. So right now, that would re require a product operator, a social operator, and linking it all in three, four different ways. What would happen in this case is that you link it, it automatically creates a link with a tiny little operator that has a little icon, in this case it would say aggregate, but you can click on it, and then on the side panel you could say, no, actually I want to send everyone's data to the groups or you know, something else. So because this direct link knows the input and the output, it can be a bit more intelligent. For example, if you make a table here, a spreadsheet, the default would be that you here get a gallery with a bunch of spreadsheets. But in this case, we have a special operator that takes a bunch of spreadsheets and combines them into one. So let's say you have word, 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 definition, and then you put all them together, it would be word, 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 group one, uh, Peter, John, Niels, Anna, and then you can see all the definitions. That's a really neat thing. And because it would know that you're connecting two spreadsheet activities, it could say, hey, would you want to use that operator? Right? So it, it helps with this kind of exploring and type checking. Um, now, the nice thing about having people using Frog in real situations is that we have a few very brave souls that are actually um, independently working with Frog, more or less, with some support from me. And they're putting into all kinds of different use cases. So this is a graph, again, that was actually run very successfully um, for a class of about four hours. And a lot of it was in, you know, in the, it was just like a, kind of a, almost a workshop. So they spent a lot of time writing. They spent in groups to giving each other feedback. This was, you know, a very long, long process. And the whole graph is complex. It's, it's very long. 
And so um, my friend was saying, hey, you know, in my head, I kind of have, you know, this is the first phase. Then there's the second phase. It's the third phase. Can I just like say this is going to be green and this is going to be blue and I'm going to call it phase one or something? I'm like, maybe. That's like there are interesting ideas like that that we can explore. Maybe you need a little uh, table of contents to kind of skip around. I mean, there could be interesting ways of dealing with that. Um, even, even simple things like right now you cannot actually. So here he has a little peer review cycle. And then he said, you know, I probably want to do this, but if I have time, maybe I'll let him do that one more time. So I'll just put that in the graph once more time. And right now you can't actually just say copy this and paste it there. Um, but that's something that you know, would help. So now you take this super long graph, and now let's say that you were actually successful constructing it somehow, and you believe that it's correct. Now you're in the orchestration mode. So this is the teacher running this graph with 40 students, right? And there's all kinds of cognitive load, orchestration load, looking at the students, looking at the time. And again, my friend is saying, I kind of you know, forgot where I was and what was, what was the next activity and where am I now? And you know, he, he was um, feeling a bit stressed out. Um, now, there's a tool called Desmos which if you haven't looked at it, it's worth looking at, which is, um, it's kind of a, a math tool, so for, for learning math um, in the classroom. It's one of the only real professional ed tech tools I've found that really cares about classroom orchestration. It was also co-founded by some primary school teachers, so um, that might be a reason. So actually, it, you know, in some ways it's much less um, advanced than Frog. On the other hand, they actually have real designers and teachers and stuff, and they've there's a lot of really cool stuff about their design. So, you know, we've talked about having a graph library in Frog, and we do have it, although it's very, very simplistic in design. But here, you go and say, well, they made a, a, a graph about military budgets that wants students to look at visualizations of military budgets and discuss it and analyze it in different ways. And this is something they tweeted out, and they got tons of retweets, and like everyone's super excited about using it in their class, which is nice. And so I go in here, and first of all, you know, there's a nice little write-up, there's a link to a New York Times article where they got the data, and then there's a, a teacher guide. And when I click on the teacher guide, it's actually a PDF that the teacher can print out with each step and some notes and a, and a screenshot of what the students will see at each step, and some teacher instructions. And I thought, that's really cool. Actually, my friend also mentioned that, that it would be great to have like, I, I, you know, just like each step of the graph kind of printed out so he could, you know, like a PowerPoint uh, slide thing. And I even thought maybe we could generate something like that automatically from a graph if we have more um, space for teachers to type in notes about why they're doing different activities and stuff. So that's kind of cool. Then you go back here and if you want to actually run a session, what we call a session in Frog, you go here and you say, I want to create a class code. And so here we have kind of two sessions. And when I go in there, the first thing I see is this thing. So it's a very small thing, but it's like super useful for teachers, right? We're like, okay, students, you know, go there and you can log in. I mean, we can add this in 10 minutes in Frog, it's not hard. But then it's interesting to see that they actually have these kind of orchestration actions that we have, some of them we have in Frog, right? So in this case, you can choose between letting the students go through the activities by themselves or you turn on teacher pacing which is kind of the default in Frog, where the student, the teacher says, you are now all here, you are now all there. Um, you can pause, so um, they have these, um, so instead of the orchestration graph, they have these uh, preview screenshots of the different stages. They have, uh, they're interested in having this teacher select examples of students' work and showcase it. So that's kind of one of 100 things you can do in Frog, but here, because this is really focused on math teaching, it's, it's kind of, I mean, here everything is special case, right? That's the difference. But it also means that they can make it very nice. So they can, uh, you can choose things, and then you can say, next activity, I'm gonna show it to the students. Um, and then their kind of dashboard view shows what the students are looking at, and then in this case, they have some written responses, so you see that. Or you can go and participate in the graph as a class member, and then actually make it a contribution yourself and share that with the class. So, and then here you see at the bottom, there is kind of teacher instruction. So as the teacher is going through, there's this kind of prompts, pedagogical prompts for the teacher. So I thought this was something that we could definitely learn from. Uh, doesn't mean we're gonna copy it, but they've clearly thought about this and a lot more people are using this on Frog, so. 
Um, so we've tried to do some things to make Frog a little bit more accessible, right? We have a blog where I've put a few um, case studies of different graphs that people have been building on. Um, I was recently in Lucerne for a conference and the pedagogical um, college in Bern presented this big OER project that they have on this, its idea sets. So it's basically very complete pedagogically appropriate open educational resources around different topics that they've developed uh, you know, specifically for Swiss teachers in Bern according to the, the teaching plan and the learning goals. So here, for example, you, have, you go to globalization and they have some uh, PowerPoint that the students will, some uh, script for the learners, some script for the teachers. And actually, when I look at the script, I mean, okay, so in one way, this is maybe not so different from a textbook and stuff like that. But so in this case, for example, watch this video and think about um, what are the conditions for globalization and write it here and then read this text and highlight certain words and then discuss whether these are examples of fragmentation or homogenization and um, you know so, so there's and I was, I was looking at this and I was thinking this is a frog graph I mean they're like do this split in two discuss this highlight these words come together discuss and so while so a bunch of these kind of things, right? Links to videos, links to interactive resources. So while I'm sitting there in the next presentation, I took this PDF and I generated a frog graph with pretty much every single activity in the, in the PDF, right? Because they, it's great because they already had the videos, they had the prompts, they had the text. I just needed to sequence it. Now, this still looks horrible, right? The nice thing though is, what if teachers didn't have to see this? What if they saw this? So, oh, this is a cool idea set. Yes, I want to run it interactively. Ah, phase one, the students should now be doing this and this and this. Uh, this is what they, the students are seeing. This is what the next activity is, so you know what you're going to go into. And by the way, you can click here to go to the advanced view. You don't have to, but if you want to dig into it, you know, the frog graph editor is always there. So the, the people in Bern are actually quite interested. And I think the nice thing is these are people who are very actively in schools. This is resources that already are being used by a lot of classes. So that could be a nice way of actually getting into classes. The final thing I want to touch upon, which will lead me a bit to the same place. Um, I, so of course, there's a lot of teachers who don't want to use any technology. And OK, we're not going to start with those, right? But there are also a lot of te teachers out there who are innovating, who are trying out new stuff, who are reading blogs or Twitter, and, oh, what's the new thing that I want to try in my classroom? And I keep seeing these kind of blog posts about you know, 67 ed tech tools, 180 great tools for your classroom, right? So things like SurveyMonkey, Wordle, Quizlet, Etherpad, all these kind of tools, right? Um, and I'm thinking, so for example, Etherpad. Most of you probably have seen it. It's kind of like Google Docs. It's open source. So it's very, the nice thing about Etherpad is it's extremely low friction. All right? You go to any Etherpad installation, um, because it's open source, and you just type in the name of the pad, or you just even type in the address, and you just get a pad for free. So a, a lot of teachers love this, because it's so easy to get going with. And I'm thinking, a lot of the tools and in individual activity types in Frog are actually already better than many of these freestanding tools, or they could easily become so with a little bit of design love. right? So for example, very simple activity, we call it brainstorm. It's basically a list where you can vote up or down, but you can configure it in all kinds of ways. You can have them vote up or down images or texts or spreadsheets or, you know, it's collaborative, but nobody is gonna go and use this because it's hidden in the complexity of Frog. So the thing is, we already have an API for exposing individual activities. So if you type in this, no, don't try to copy it, uh, <laughs> in your browser right now, you will get with no login, with no orchestration graph, that specific voting list um, exactly configured like you just saw. So we didn't make this because we thought this was a fun thing to type in, but because Denis Gillet uh, has a tool called Grasp, which is actually used in a number of schools, which has been developed over many years. And they didn't have any synchronous activities, any activities that support synchronous collaboration. So with um, one of his, uh, his uh, programmers, we kind of prototyped this API to access individual frog activities. So here, if you go into, and you see this looks totally different than, uh, 
frog. There's no concept of orchestration graphs. But if you go into the, what they call an inquiry space and you say, I want to add a new activity, you can now add a frog app. And if you go there, you see a list of all the frog apps. They call them apps. We call them activity types. And you can select one. You can configure it. And so here you have an inquiry space with four different frog activities. And if we look in uh, open to students, um, it's even totally different because they have kind of like a document model. But here you have the rich text editor, right? Um, here you have uh, the live, uh, live synchronized quiz. Here you have the, the um, CK board, we call it, with, where you can add ideas and drag them around. And again, the students are in grasp. They don't know that anything's going on. They have no problem with this. Uh, you can have a little chat. Um, and then the teacher gets access to our dashboards and stuff like that. You can insert uh, spreadsheets in the chat, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I thought that was kind of an interesting way of integrating. But as I started to see all these examples of people just using these standalone tools, I started thinking maybe we could also expose these standalone tools to the world without this crazy URL, right? So my first attempt was actually with this rich text editor because we had a student, you might remember, from the semester project who worked on this very hard. And I want this to be the best collaborative rich text editor for, for a small group collaboration, right? Because Google Docs will never compete with all of their features, but it's not written for five students in a class for 10 minutes writing an answer. So maybe we can actually even be better than them for that specific use case. And so I want lots of people to use it. So I made frogwrite, you can't really see the URL there, but frogwrite.ch slash anything you want, and you have a document, and the anything you want is the name of the document, and you can give that URL to how many people you want, and you can collaboratively edit. Because my idea was, I just want to start, I don't want to wait for the next experiment with 30 students. I just want to start using this. So when I'm on a Skype call with a bunch of academics, I'm like, hey, let's take notes in this document. And then maybe I'll get feedback, or maybe I myself will say, oh, this, you know, I need to tweak this feature. This is a bit annoying. Um, and we could, I think we could think about taking this further. So imagine we had something like frog learning tools, or hopefully some much better name, because there's also an issue with frog, just like with Tagami. Um, but let's say you went there, and I don't have beautiful mock-ups, but you can imagine, you know, you come in there and it's like, hey, you know, we have a rich text editor, we have a voting list, we have um, a concept map, we have, so we wouldn't choose all of the frog activities, because some are super specific, but some of the ones are really polished and can be used for many things. And then you say, hey, I want to do the voting list. So, okay, here's the link to the students. You as a teacher still have some simple orchestration tools. You can choose when to open it. You can pause it. You have access to the dashboard. But there's no concept. it's all nice and designed, and there's no concept of an orchestration graph and this stuff. It's just very clean. However, now why are we doing all this? Partly, it would be great to have more people use Frog in general and the technology. But think of this as a gateway drug. Because now you're a teacher, and you've been using this voting tool in all your classes to discuss you know, um, where you should do the next seminar. And then suddenly you see, huh, would you like a two-stage voting? Would you like the students first to enter their ideas individually and then vote on them instead of having, you know, oh yeah, that's cool, I want a two-stage voting. Okay, stage one, stage two. Oh, there's an advanced graph editor. Hmm, wonder what happens if I click there. So, you know, one way could be to say, here we have a fully featured graph uh, based on idea sets developed by, by uh, uh, you know, um, educators, and you can just click here to open that whole graph. That's one way in which we could make Frog more accessible. Another way would be to kind of build up from individual activities that people really like to use, and then say, hey, you know, do you want to do a jigsaw? Okay, just click here, you've got a jigsaw. So anyway, those were just a few ideas how we might think about making Frog um, more accessible. Thank you. Thank you.